Grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome. Today we'll be looking at our eternal union with Christ. Our eternal union with Christ. And we're talking about the union of the believer and the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the greatest and the best of all blessing we can ever wish for as human. And that's the zenith of all God can give to us. Because in giving us the Lord Jesus Christ, God has made us one with himself in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there are two basic, two mystical union, the two highest union in the Bible is the union of the divine trinity and the union of christ and his believers the union of the divine trinity that is god as the father god the son and god the holy spirit is a mystical union we use the word mystical with the root word the mysterious the mysterious union now when we say something is mysterious or mystical we're referring to the fact that it's strange it's um it's 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 not comprehensible by any human reasoning <laughs> it's going to defy all human understanding because the union of the divine trinity is so mysterious that um, you we had to come up or not the church fathers had to come up with certain terms to describe that union you don't see the word trinity in the bible but the fact is there and it's actually from the latin word the triune god they came up with the term the triune god that is the god that is three but yet one the god that is one but yet three First John 5 7 says that there are three that bear record in heaven the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. And of course, God has said in Deuteronomy 6 4, I believe, He said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And all through the Bible, God keeps saying that He is one. But here we have Him as the Father, the Son, and as the Spirit. And it's because the union in the Divine Trinity is such a mysterious union that, yes, it's one God. We only have one God, but we have Him as the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. They coexist and they co inherit coexist means that they live from eternity past to eternity future uh, you i don't think you ever find any part in the scripture that says that okay this father was existing before the son before the spirit because in the early the early centuries some heretical schools have come up with certain which is called the monism. they came up with the time that god was transfiguring in the old testament he was the father in the gospel he was the son then in the epistles from the resurrection of christ is the spirit indirectly they were saying that uh, that god the son did not exist from eternity past and, uh, and the spirit too did not exist from the old testament and of course the church fathers termed that as heresy and of course the second school of thought which is known as tritism this came up with the time that there are three gods there are three separate gods and of course they come in serious trouble when they come across scriptures such as Deuteronomy 6 for the hero is read the Lord your God is one Isaiah 45 God has said to you that uh, beside me there is no other God and God says is one so of course the church fathers now came up with the term the Trinity that is the God that is one yet three they just left it as the way John first John 5 7 left it that there are three that bear records in heaven the Father the Word and the Holy Ghost these three are one It's a mysterious union and um, that's the union that uh, we we can say is the best illustration the Lord actually used to describe how he wants to be united with us as believers he said that from John 14 to John 17 pretty much is validatory sermon and prayers he did mention the fact that he was going to be in the father and the father is in him and we are going to be in him as well we go through those scriptures as we read along so the union of Christ and his believers is a picture uh, it's uh, it's pattern after the union of the divine trinity god has brought us into that union with the divine trinity because we are his children and we look at more so the entire new testament can be summarized as the wonderful story and record of the organic union of christ and his believers that is the record of the union between christ and his believers and a lot of similitudes were used all through the scriptures the husband the wife uh, the head and the body the vine and the branches we are going to look at that as we go on in this teaching so the lord repeatedly prayed for this union in john 17. it was so important to him all through which is time really um, a lot of bible scholars and we believe as well that the greatest prayer in the bible was that prayer in john 17 because he here was god praying to god god the son praying to god the father and the priority in his prayers he kept on repeating it that he wanted to be one 
to be in union with us the believers of course the father hacking to that prayer and all through in john 17 23 and so john 17 the last verse also i in them i in them you in me he kept on from john 14 he was giving a picture because that was pretty much his um you want to call it yeah the validatory sermon because he was going but yet he was telling them a lot of things in john 14 he said that in that at that day that you will know that i am in the father you are in me and i in you and he also said as well that those who uh those who receive his word and love him the father they will be loved by the father and he and the father will come and make their abode in us so he kept on praying it and he kept on teaching it john 15 tells us about the vine and the branches all three was giving us this picture of this organic union that was going to exist upon his resurrection so let's look at some of the scriptures he said at that day you shall know that i am in the my father and you in me and i in you john 14 20. so he was talking about from resurrection of course the day we believe was referring to his resurrection from death because he had to be the grain of wheat from john 12 24 that died and resurrected to produce many grains so that they may be one in us this was part of his prayer in john 17 as well that we will be one with the divine trinity that's the goal of god god's intention even from creation from genesis 1 and genesis 2 telling adam to eat of the tree of life was just a picture to let us know that god wanted to be our life god wants to be our life from eternity past that has been his goal that has been his intention and now but of course there had to be certain processes certain things had to be in place before that could materialize and part of that process was like he had to incarnate god had to manifest in the flesh in the person of the lord jesus christ and of course go through the human living now go through death because in going through death he will release that divine life the divine life is just himself into us and now we will be his uh, duplication so it's a coherence <clears throat> and a mutual abiding union that is a coherence and a mutual abiding is when two parties two or more parties are living in each other it's a very mysterious union because that's it's it's impossible anywhere under heaven <laughs> except in the divine trinity because you can have a husband and a wife but they don't live in each other you can have a siblings they don't live in even twins don't live in each other so coexist means that they exist simultaneously from eternity past to the present to eternity future the trinity now coherence is that they are living in each other I need a poor illustration I can use. We're always going to fall short looking for earthly illustration to uh, to define spiritual truths. My fingers, for example, your fingers, the fingers of any human, yeah, they coexist, but at the same time, they also co-inhere in each other in the sense that uh, the movement of one forces the other to move. I know it's a poor illustration, but it's just the nearest we could find. So coherence is when two or more parties are living in each other. Just like the Lord said in John 14 that, I am in my father and the father is in me it's mysterious and he's filled with the spirit and so the father is living in the son the son is living in the father the son is filled with the spirit it's a very mysterious union so the parties live in each other and that's the picture that is where he intended to bring us into upon his restoration that is where we are today that's why we say we are in eternal union with the Lord Jesus Christ also looking ahead, this is the foundation and central truth of everything in the Christian faith. So the foundation and central truth of everything in the Christian faith is based on this our union with Christ. From redemption, from regeneration, sanctification, there is nothing in the Christian faith. We dare not touch any blessing. We dare not touch anything in the kingdom of God outside our union with Christ. <laughs> we will become a big thief because it is only in union with Him that's how we can take benefit of everything that the lord has prepared for us and we'll go through some of the scriptures so without this union with him there could be no redemption there will be no salvation no justification no sanctification no reconciliation there will be no transformation there's no conformation to the image of christ because what what are we going to be conformed to if we're not in if we're, if we're not in union with him there will be no fellowship with the divine trinity there will be no uh there's no hope of spending eternity with god and could you imagine well, i mean it just it just shows the picture of our impotency without our union with christ i mean we're just naked we're uh, we have we're absolutely nothing that's why i said without me that abide in me and hire you for without me you can do nothing so we're actually nothing we are just worthless without the union with christ but with union with christ oh my god the lord has done great things for us we are seated with him in heavenly places divine healing is by union with him whether it's prosperity is by union with him fellowship with god is by union with him 
him, spending eternity is by union with him, being uh, a, a vessel that bears fruit. It's through union with him, like he said in John 15. So everything in the Christian faith has its roots in union with Christ. What a joy. Because he did not only make us one with him upon his resurrection but he actually came to become a man to be one with us that was why we could identify with him in his death romans chapter 6 says that as many that have been baptized into christ we were baptized into his death we were identified with his death so while he was on the cross he was not just the only person on the cross we were in him on the cross because technically in the eyes of god he became man he took up humanity and we were parts with him that's why paul could say or the scripture could say that i have been crucified with christ that's why we go through the water baptism to identify with him in his death so this union is the greatest is the chiefest the greatest and the zenith of all blessings i don't think in my opinion there will be any blessing that will be more superior to the union with christ in my opinion i don't think there's any blessing that under heaven will be will ever match or be above the union with christ because it is from it everything flows from spending eternity with god in heaven is going to be based on union uh first corinthians 1 says that god is faithful who has called us to fellowship with his son the lord jesus christ our lord god is faithful we will also confirm us to the very end just because we are in union with him and it, it, it actually costed him his life for this union to be a reality it wasn't a cheap it wasn't a cheap accomplishment. He had to pay with his life. He had to pay with his blood. It wasn't a cheap thing. So let's not think that, oh, he just came to the earth and one way, he just made us one with him. No, 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 no. Uh, it's, it's a great, great price that the Lord paid to become one with us. Because a lot of things, we were falling in Adam and he had to redeem us and reconcile us back to God. And that took a lot of a lot of years of the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, the four gospel period, and it actually even costed him his life. He had to lay down his life. He said, yeah, yeah, I have come that they may have life. He said, the Son of Man came that he might become the ransom. So what a joy. And First John, John 10, 10, that I have come that they may have life and we may have it more abundantly. This union which was planned by God in eternity past is the very means used by God for man's total salvation. God will consummate this union in the new Jerusalem, that is the eternal, eternity future, Revelation 21 and 22. So God planned for this union before the foundation of the world. And we will be looking at Ephesians chapter 1 to scriptures that back this up. That God in eternity past had planned that we were going to, that a certain, he has selected us, he chose us in Christ, in union with Christ in eternity past because he wanted to express himself through us human vessels on the surface of the earth so that he could carry out the work only god can do what he has ordained to be done through our life we can of our own self do nothing <laughs> so we are only we are only as effective as we allow god to walk in us both to will and to do for his good pleasure so god's best gift for man is simply union with christ when God decides to bless any man, to, uh, to, 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 make, to bring out his glory from any man, he always goes back to this same thing, union with Christ. Do you know why? I think in my opinion, because God himself is in Christ. God himself is in Christ. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So God is in Christ. So he's bringing every one of his saints, the called ones, into Christ. And by coming into Christ, he said that no one can come to me except the Father draws them. So if the Father is drawing people to Christ. And so he's bringing us into union with him because everything we will ever do on the surface of this earth, God wants it to be in union with Christ because that's the person that is most pleasing unto God. So this is my son in whom I'm well pleased with. So and Hebrews 13, also 20, 21, also saying, the God of peace make us perfect in every good work, working in us that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be glory forever and ever. So what a joy for what the Lord has done. So let's go through some of the scriptures. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. It is of God. You, it is of God you are in Christ Jesus. That it is of God that we are. Let's first establish that fact that it is of God that you and I, believers in Christ Jesus, we are in Christ Jesus. Nobody can get himself in union with Christ except God is the one that causes this to happen. Of course, he said, no one can come to me except the Father draws them. 
So the Father is the only one that can bring anyone to Christ. So we can't claim credit for even our salvation. We can't claim credit, he said in Ephesians 2, that uh, it's not that no, so that no one will boast, that no one should take any glory because it is God. It is by God. Even Ephesians chapter 2 also states it as well that it is of God only that our salvation is by grace, just by grace, so that nobody will boast against any other person. Or oh, because if it was by our works, then we could be able to boast that yes. And we heard the gospel and this is what we did but God by his spirit was causing was convicting us of our sin and of our need of the Savior so this is Ephesians chapter 1 and from the verses we'll be looking at from the Good News Bible Ephesians 1 to God's people in Ephesus who are faithful in their life in union with Christ in union with Christ you see that phrase in some translation is put in there as in Christ and all true but the actual meaning from the Greek context is that in union with Christ so we are faithful in our life in union with him so reading ahead as well in I think uh, in Ephesians still on Ephesians 1 let us give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ that is this is where the fruit of thanksgiving which Hebrews 13 also makes us to understand Hebrews 13 15 that through the sacrifice of our lips the fruit of thanksgiving to God through Christ for in our union with Christ he has blessed us by giving us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly world so without union with Christ there could be no blessing from God going by what the scriptures say so God is doing everything he's doing in our life because of our union with Christ because of our identity with Christ that's what makes us Christian we are Christians because we are human beings that the Lord himself has brought us he has brought us is into himself as one entity that's why he calls us his body he calls us his bride so reading ahead from still from Ephesians chapter 1 as well it says even before the world was made God had already chosen us to be his through our union with Christ so so before the foundation of the world so this wasn't something that happened just because of because Adam fell or because when we were born that's when we decided to come in union with Christ God planned this in eternity past and this was before Genesis 1 verse 1. In eternity past, it was eternity past, time was created in Genesis chapter 1, the sun and the day, but the, the sun and uh, the day and the night. But in eternity past, God had already chosen us to be his through our union with Christ. So we are God's property. We belong to the Lord. We are not our own. We belong to him. And God made us his through our union with Christ so that we will be holy and without fault before him. Being holy, that is being separated unto God being sanctified unto God and without fault before him so we are blameless as Colossians chapter 1 makes us to understand I think 2021 that we are blameless before him because of the Lord Jesus Christ of course it doesn't mean that we live a reckless life or we live an unholy life that's not the purpose the goal is that he has redeemed us and has made us faultless in his sight yet he still carries out his work of sanctification he carries out his work of transformation in our life and these are steps we go through in our Christian faith also reading from still on uh, Ephesians chapter 1 because of his love God had already decided that through Jesus Christ, he would make us his sons and daughters. This was his pleasure and purpose. So this was God's pleasure. This was God's purpose in eternity past. This was before Adam was created in Genesis chapter 1. This was before Adam's sin. God had already taken pleasure and had a purpose for every one of us that are saints or his children today so what did he do because he said because of his love it was the love of God that is the root of this so the love of God is what brought this about I'd already decided that through Jesus Christ that is through our union with Christ he would make us his sons and daughters so this delighted God it was his good pleasure he created all things going by Revelation chapter 4 and that God created all things because of his pleasure but when it comes to us as a student he calls it his good pleasure say it is God who works in us both to will and to do for his good pleasure what a joy so let us praise God for his glorious grace for the free gift he gave us in his dear son what a marvelous gift a gift of inestimable value that's why Paul said in Philippians 3 that I count all things but dung for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ because the gift he has given to us God has given himself to us 
giving us the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. God has given himself his entirety to us. That's why we call it that that's the best and the greatest gift we could ever get from God. Because in the person of the Son, God is made manifest in the flesh. So reading ahead as well, I think uh, in all his wisdom and insight, God did what he had, this is still Ephesians chapter 1, God did what he had purpose and made known to us the secret plan he had already decided to complete by means of Christ. And everything God will ever do, especially going back from the New Testament record, it will always be by means of Christ. Anything we ever desire from God, God will never go outside of the means of Christ because that's the means He used to relate with us as humans. And because whether it's healing, whether it's prosperity, spiritual growth, eternity with God, it's always going to go by this phrase, by means of Christ. So He said, In all His wisdom and insight, God did what He had purposed from eternity past and made known to us the secret plan. It was a secret. It was a mystery and until it was unveiled, there was no way we could know about it <laughs> until it was unveiled that he had already decided to complete by means of Christ. So we are not an accident on the surface of the earth. God knew us <laughs> before creation. So our knowing God today, we can't take pride in it or we can't boast in it against another person. God had a plan and which is the next one we read in Ephesians 2 where it talks about that he had created us for good deeds. So this plan which God will complete is to bring all creation together, everything in heaven and earth with Christ as a head in Ephesians chapter 1. Still the good news Bible. So God's goal and God's means and God's plan is always through the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 2 as well. Still on the good news version. All things, this is, sorry, this is Ephesians chapter 1. All things are, Ephesians 1, I think is 11. All things are done according to God's plan and decision. And God chose us to be His own people in union with Christ because of His own purpose, based on what He had decided from the very beginning. So we can see all through, uh, it's, it sounds like God was just repeating himself, uh, but it was, the, it was a deliberate repetition that, look, I had a purpose in eternity past, I had a plan, I had a goal, and I had a pleasure, I had a will. And eternity past, was in, that was before Genesis chapter 1, God made us in union with him because of his own purpose, based on what he had decided from the very beginning. Based on what he had decided from the very beginning, God said he had a plan, he had a vision, he he had a goal and what was that goal that he had a plan to express himself to make us one with Christ to bring us in union with the Lord Jesus Christ so we could go to Ephesians chapter 2 as well in union with Christ Jesus he raised us up with him to rule with him in the heavenlies so there's a lot of things that uh, everything God does, even in creation, everything has a purpose. Every of his step, every of his action, they are always with a specific intent at heart. He has a purpose and intention towards it. So part of his intention is that he raised us up with him to rule with him in the heavenlies. There's no way we can express or exercise our dominion in Christ Jesus on the earth here without God raising us up together with Christ. If he raised us up together with Christ, it's because we died with Christ on the cross of Calvary. So in the eyes of God, when the Lord Jesus Christ was going through the, uh, the cross, the cross of Calvary, dying for us, in the eyes of God, we were in him. We died with him. Because he was taking the old creation with himself to, the, uh, to, 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 to terminate it in the eyes of God, to reconcile all things back to God, Colossians chapter 1. So what now happens is, after he died and the Lord raised him, after God raised him from there, we were raised together with him. That's why we go through water baptism where we are buried with him in death and we are raised to the newness of life. So God has made us, this is Ephesians 2, 10, I believe, God has made us what we are. And in union with Christ Jesus, he has created us for a life of good deeds, which he has already prepared for us to do. So this is something he has prepared for us to do from eternity past. So I'm not coming to the surface of the earth, God's expectation for you and I as believers is not for, or any man, any creature, uh, any human being, is not to come to the earth to start finding out what is the best thing in town, what's the, what's invoked to get done, or how do I, many decisions we make as human because of the fallen nature of Adam is sometimes based on economical reason, or what's going to bring out the best money, what's going to bring out the most profitable, which is not really, I'm not saying it's bad, if it's rooted in God, and but so our goal and our plan is like, this scripture is giving us that understanding that God has chosen us in union with Christ for a specific purpose which is for good deeds which he has prepared already for us to do 
So what's part of our body now as believers? That Lord, what is it that like Paul was asking? You know, what what happened? The account of the Lord and uh, Saul before he got converted in Acts nine. That Lord, what would you have me to do? And the Lord said, Go. You'll be told what to do. So our posture every day should be that Lord, we are here again. Lord, can you please carry out your intention, your purpose, your plan through my life? Let it be you manifesting yourself through me. Let it be you, men are seen and reaping from my life. And what a joy, what a job, what a loss. Still on Ephesians chapter 2. But now in union with Christ Jesus, you who used to be far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So his death was a perikusa, it was a requirement. Without his death, without his blood, there is no access to God. So these are part of the things God used to bring us in union with Christ. The blood had to be shed <laughs> because the life of the flesh is in the blood. So the blood had to be shed for us to receive the life of God into us. So in union with him, you two are built together with all the others into a place where God through his spirit dwells. That's where God dwells through his spirit. It's Ephesians 2, verse 22, the last verse here. So we can see there are so many blessings. Of course, we don't have all the space and time to bring a picture of what the benefits we enjoy in union with Christ. So we can see from here, we well, Ephesians chapter 3 as well. Probably should have put it, but uh, later on I, there was really no time but when i saw it ephesians chapter 3 when it says we have boldness and access into his presence through our union with christ so everything from our predestination which we'll probably do a summary of what we just looked at for example that our predestination was in union with christ predestination was like before the foundation of the world god had predestined us god had foreordained us he had chosen us our choosing was in union with christ god chose us in union with christ our creation genesis 1 26 27 was in union with Christ. Somebody might ask, How is our union, our creation in union with Christ? We were created in the image and the likeness of God. And the question is, What is the image of God? <laughs> Hebrews 2, Hebrews 1 tells us that is the express image of the Father. Colossians 1 as well also tells us that is the express image of God. So the express image of God is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we are conformed to his image. So our creation was for union with Christ. He begot us in union with Christ. If uh, one or two scriptures we could use John 1 12, it said he came to his own, his soon did not receive him, but to well, as many that receive him today may give power to become the sons of God, the children of God, who are not born of blood, who are not born of the will of flesh, who are not born of the will of man, or but who are born of God. And we were begotten. Uh, not by any corruptible seed, which is the word of God, as a uh, piece of Peter makes us to understand. He lives in us through union with Christ. So God is living in us through union with Christ. First John 4, 9 tells us that um, the love of God was manifested among us that we should live through him. And also First John 4, 15 also tells us that whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him and he in God. So God is living in us because of our union with the Lord Jesus Christ because the Father and the Son are one. He said, I and the Father are one. So his blessing our true union with Christ. We read this from Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. So every blessing that God has for us in the kingdom of God is true union with Christ. We dare not touch any blessing outside our union with the Lord Jesus Christ because it is his own resume if you allow me to use that expression it is his own status before god that qualifies us that's why he says that whatever you ask in my name that is in my name pretty much is saying that in oneness with me in union with him just like a husband and a wife are one in the eyes of god and um, so our fruitfulness also is in is true union with christ he said this in john 15 he said that without me you can do nothing that whoever abides in him and he abides in the person that will bear much fruit so our fruitfulness is in union with christ as well Romans 7 also tells us that we've been espoused uh, and that, uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ, that because we've been espoused to the Lord Jesus Christ so that we can bear fruit unto God. Our communion and fellowship with Him is true union with Christ. Say, God is faithful by whom you are called into fellowship with the Son, Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1 9. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. So our communion. 1 John 1 also. I mean, there are a lot of scripture. 1 John 1 says, Our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. So you can see the mysterious blessings that we enjoy through union with Christ. So everything in His kingdom is true union with Christ. Everything in the kingdom. So the earlier. 
uh, the more we know that's why paul was saying that he counts all things for dung for dung for the excellency of the knowledge of christ because he knew that there was nothing he, he said is what he is by the grace of god and the grace of god is the person of the lord jesus christ the grace and truth <laughs> came through christ jesus so you can see everything we enjoy in the kingdom of god also this was his prayer the lord's prayer in john 17 he said that this is eternal life that they may know you that's the god and him the lord jesus christ whom you have sent so you could imagine that he knows that say that they made that the more we our knowledge be that's why all through the epistles we keep saying that prayer that we grow in the knowledge of the person of the lord jesus christ and what a joy for what the lord is doing so these are some phases phrases in the new testament you see this it's peppered and salted and uh, all through the new testament these are not everything but these are just a few of them so wherever you see the word in christ is still pointed to the union with christ our union with christ is the union of the believer and the law in him in womb by womb by christ by him through him with christ through him these phrases are all true and i believe the holy spirit is bringing this out to reveal that not that in him we live we move and have our being so everything that christ lives in me and all through the bible if we keep seeing that scripture those phrases by him through him that is all those blessings walking in the christ walking in the spirit what the lord is revealing to us is like we have this through our lord jesus christ romans chapter 5 for example says that therefore being justified by faith we have peace with god through our lord jesus christ we keep seeing all through those phrases or those prepositions all through the bible indicating that everything in the new covenant is going to be by union with christ even israel which was a type of the church in the old testament they were who they were they were different from every other human on the surface of the earth the only difference was that god had just made them as he united himself to them god calls them his wife and god calls them his children his own people so they were in union with god so anytime they go into battle victory was assured as long as they do what god asked them to do they were a special people not because they had 15 fingers or they had three heads or they had some kind of different uh composition in their body they were just like every other person externally but something was different about them because they were a covenant they were people in covenant union with god so when they are going into battle they realize that look there's an invisible force the elements of creation are working in our behalf and could you imagine what israel was enjoying can we compare to what we have if god said that the old testament had a flaw that they, that that wasn't the best of arrangement you could imagine what we now enjoy i believe part of this is to make us aware and conscious of the fact that we are never by ourselves we are not on our own the lord said he will never leave us nor forsake us he's living right in us to carry out his will his purpose so whether in the place uh, your career your marketplace in the family in the church anywhere you are as a believer just that consciousness that god has added christ to my life what a joy i know sometimes in the sports world or in even in the corporate world they pride themselves when they get a star player or a star coach or something to join their team can we ever compare that to the person of the lord jesus christ can i compare or can you compare your life without christ being in union with christ and so that's why god needs that's why the prayer was given that the eyes for understanding may be enlightened to know the hope of our calling and the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe so the more we are conscious of the fact that i am in union with christ i am the branch he is the vine the vine supplies the nutrients that makes me to bear the fruit and i remain connected to the vine the fruitfulness is assured and guaranteed because the glory is not coming to me it's not coming to you it's coming to him so what a joy that we have this blessing in the new covenant so here are some of the similitudes used in the bible to describe this union the head and the body that's the head of the church the person of the lord jesus christ and the body and you look at this expression and you can tell that these are organic union when we say something is organic it's not mechanical it's not like a building for example i don't think there's a there's an organic union in the building between the foundation and the pillars and what have you because it's just a structure you don't see life going flowing through or like a toy a toy baby it's a, a doll i mean it's there's no life flowing but god uses very graphic living things to describe our union with him like the head and the body they are connected so the identity of the body is the head in most cases in our past international passports or id card they don't ask us to take pictures of our hand <laughs> i don't take picture of my leg and show us my id no they just need the picture of the head and from there they just 
attach the name to it so our identity is the person of the lord jesus christ is our head and we are the members of his body the head expresses his intention and his will through the members of his body and that's the blessing that we enjoy so there's an organic union a constant flow of traffic blood tissues and what have you things are going continuously between the head and the body also the husband and the wife and this is oneness before god said the two shall become one Christ being the bridegroom and we as well as the bride, an organic union, also the vine and its branches. And note that each of these illustrations or whatever is used in the Bible does not, they don't give a full picture to the zenith of everything of our union with the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. But these are pictures that illustrations around us that are nearest to what God can use to tell us about it. For example, the husband and the wife. The husband and the wife, they are not in coherence, union with each other. A husband and a wife, they don't live in each other. <laughs> they are two separate. Of, yes, one in the sight of God, but they are not living in each other. But the union with Christ is far beyond the husband and the wife because he is living in us and we are living in him. So it's the union we have, that's why it's called a mystical union because there's hardly anything around us that would be a perfect picture. So God has to use things that are closest to what he's trying to describe to us. So the vine and the branches as well. I'm the vine, you are the branches. Also the elder brother and the younger brother is the uh, first begotten from the dead, the firstborn from the dead. And we are his many brothers in, uh, in Christ Jesus. He's going by Hebrews chapter 2 as well. Because of this union, we call him our husband, our bridegroom, our head. That is where life flows from. Life flows from the head to the different parts of the body. We call him our life. Christ is our life. That is the very essence and the element of our being. The life of any creature is what determines its, um, its dominion on the surface of the earth. I don't think um, uh, uh, a, an animal that lives on the land can dare go into the waters to try to claim territory over a fish or the aquatic animal because that's their world that's the realm they live in and there so there's animal life there's plant life we have human life we have angelic life and we also have the god life god through the person of the lord jesus christ and through redemption has given us the very life of god into our being what a joy this is what makes us one with the lord and the life of god is not separate from god the life of god is just god himself the life of God is just God. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So we also call him our vine. That is the very essence, the source of everything that comes into our life, our roots. That is where everything is flowing from, like a plant and the roots. And the root is usually hidden. That's why Colossians 2 tells us that we should be rooted and grounded in him. Because we learned from, uh, from agriculturists that the depth of or any root determines the height of the tree. So a root that is probably, let's imagine, 5,000 feet below sea level, below the ground, that the height of that tree will be more than that 5,000 feet, can be more than that 5,000 feet. So the height of any tree is determined by the depth of its root. So that's why in Colossians 2, we are told that we should be rooted in him. So the more we are rooted in him, in his knowledge, in his person, in his uh, works, the more our rising will be and our fruitfulness. And we also learned that the, 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 the level of nutrition or quality of any fruit is determined by the quality of the roots if the roots is poisonous the fruits are going to be poisonous so that's why he wants us to be rooted in him we also call him our foundation first corinthians chapter 3 says that no other foundation can anyone lay except that which is laid in christ jesus we call him our elder brother is our elder brother because we are his many brothers in the new creation there's no brother and sister per se because i mean Colossians 3 and Galatians 3 tells us there's no Jew, there's no Gentile, there's no female, there's no, there's no male, there's no female, no born, no free. All are one in Christ. It's a mysterious union, the union, uh, the new creation union. Also, we call him our Lord, our Lord. That is our owner, the one that possesses every part of us. So because of this union, he calls us his wife, his bride, his body. To express him, wife for satisfaction, the body to express him for relaxation, his vessels, uh, we are his chosen vessels, like he said of Paul, that he is the chosen vessel of Israel. We are the vessels of God. He said we had uh, we have this treasure in acting vessels. We are the vessels of mercy, vessels of mercy. And a vessel doesn't have any value in itself except by the content it carries. So a vessel of crude oil is not going to carry the same value as a vessel of 
water. <laughs> so versus the value of any vessel is dependent on the content that is in that vessel. So could you imagine God says that we have the vessel and the content we are carrying is such a content that is inestimable in value. It is beyond, he's the greatest physician, he's the creator of all things, all wisdom reside in him, uh, all things past, present, future, he made all things, he sustained all things by his word. So you could imagine how priceless we are as saints of God, as children of God in the eyes of God. That's why there could be no greater gift God can give to us or to any human aside from union with Christ. So we are vessels of mercy, vessels of mercy. What a joy, a royal priest, a chosen generation. We are his branches as well, the branches attached to the vine. We are his temple. That is the dwelling place of God, the dwell, the very dwelling place where God dwells. And also we are his many brothers, we are his house. Hebrews chapter 3 that says that, um, that we are his house. If we hold fast our confidence to the very hand, that is where he resides. So, in, for example, in Ephesians chapter 3, it says that we might be strengthened with, power, with might by spirit in our inner man, that Christ will make his home in our heart. So we are his house, he's living in us. It's addressed on the surface of the earth. It's we, the saints of God. So when people are looking for Christ, when they are looking for the Lord, the Lord will point them to his saints. That that's where my house is. That's my residential address on the surface of the earth. What a joy. Hallelujah. <laughs> the Lord and the house of God. <laughs> his children as well. Hebrews chapter 2. His children and the children who you have given unto me. So also looking ahead and whatever, this Colossians chapter 3, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to, the, to God the Father through him. So everything we are doing in the Christian faith, God is saying that has to be in the name of the Lord. And doing things in the name of the Lord is doing things in oneness with the Lord Jesus Christ, in union with the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That everything we have, there's a consciousness, whether it's at home, it doesn't mean that, what he said, whatever, whether in the church, whether to brothers, whether in the marketplace, whether in your career, whether in your neighborhood where you are living, whether even among spouses, siblings, uh, parents to their children, children to parents, God says everything should be done, whether in word or deed, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So every day when we are going out, that God please make us aware and conscious of the fact that we are going in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. That is, we are coming in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean that we are items of worship. No, that belongs to the Godhead. But we are coming there as his representatives. And representative, I don't mean representative like the person we are represented is far from us or distant. No, we are the embodiment. I like the word the embodiment of Christ. That is, we are not just representing him, but we are embodied. That means we, we, he dwells in us. We are the ones carrying him about. We are his vessels. He is the container. He's not just sitting in heaven and we are here trying to do something and, uh, uh, like an ambassador in an earthly realm definition could be. Yes, we are ambassadors of Christ, but we are ambassadors and much more we are the embodiment of Christ. The one that is sending us is actually living in us. That's why he said that as the Father has sent me, so have I sent you. How did the Father send Sent him. The Father sent him by living in him. He said, I am always with the Father and the Father is in me and I am in the Father. And he said, that is the pattern he's using to send us into the world. So we are never by ourselves. Colossians chapter 3 verse 4 also says, For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. So our life is hidden with Christ in God. What a joy that our true life is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ who is our life. So Christ is our life as the redeemed of the Lord. What a joy for what the Lord has done for us. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and hide him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. For without me, you can do nothing. Sometime ago, I saw that. I, I was wondering that, why is the Lord not saying bears much fruit? Like a plural. Because when you use much, indirectly you're saying that it's more than one. But he was very careful to just use much fruit. Because the fruit is one. <laughs> the fruit is just one. <laughs> the fruit is the person of Christ. God, John 15, God is the gardener, the father. The son <laughs> is the vine. We are the branches. So the seed, God is sowing everywhere, going by also the parable of the seed. So is the person of Jesus. So the seed is the Lord Jesus Christ. The fruit is also the Lord Jesus Christ. So God is planting the seed of Christ into our life. So we're in union with him. And his goal is that this seed, we will, if we will allow him as his children, for that seed to keep growing, watering it with the word of God, so that the word will reap the fruits of Christ from our life. That's why I said we will bear much fruit. The fruit is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Could there be any better fruits than Christ? 
a fruit is what adds value to people when like picking up an orange or mango this different fruit they all carry different nutrients but the person of christ is a multi-purpose fruit whether it is healing whether it's for marriage whether it's for finance in any area of life and is this fruit is light and there's darkness everywhere so god is saying the more that we are sowing the fruit of his son into our life and we are watering it the more the fruits the world can reap the fruit of christ from our life that's why we are called the aroma of christ also revelations i think chapter 21 or 22 verse 1 or 2 talks about that the fruits that come the 12 manners of fruits in a year and what a joy that that fruit is pointing to the person of the lord jesus christ for the healing of nations so this is not a mechanical union but a vital organic and mystical union where the two live in one another just like we said earlier a coherence union where both of them are living in each other so the two are bound together is the same sap in the vine that is in the branches the same life the life that is in the lord is the same life that is in the father that is the same life god has put in us it's a marvel i don't think there's anywhere in the scriptures where it tells us that the life of god is in the angels that's why the angels are wondering, what is man that you are mindful of him? God made us in his image and likeness and he has now put his life in us and his life is not separate from him. In the Old Testament, God made us in his image and his likeness, but man did not, there was no man that had the life of God in him. Adam lost that privilege when he ate the forbidden fruit, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, when he didn't obey God to eat of the tree of life. But God has now brought us in union with him in the New Testament. That's why he said, I have come that they may have life. And that's why the last Adam, the scripture said, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit, 1 Corinthians 15, 45. So the head and the body are eternally one. The head expresses itself through members of his body. The husband and the wife are one in the eyes of God. So in the eyes of God, the husband and the wife are one. The head and the body are one. And, uh, you can, there's no time we'll have gone to Ephesians chapter 5 to read about the organic, organic union. I think the next feature also, also said that we are members of, okay, grafting before we get into the fact where it say we are members of his body, the flesh of his flesh, the bone of his bone. So grafting is a an agricultural term where two different plants or two plants are being brought together to grow as one. It's done, and I believe that many of these scientific discoveries are things that God allowed because they, there's, a, there's a spiritual lesson that can come from it. Because God even used the term. It's amazing that in the days when the Bible was written, grafting was existing. That's why in Romans 11, we have a picture of that. So grafting is when two plants are brought together, a lower plant and a, a higher plant or a helper plant, which is mostly called the sion, S-C-I-O-N, and the rootstock. The lower plants were brought they are brought together so that they can grow as one so this illustration was used in romans 11 that we've been grafted into christ we were born into adam biologically now because god we fell in adam god has now in his mercy redeemed us by grafting us into christ so he translated us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son so we were grafted into christ which is the divinity that's from our humanity was brought with divinity so we are no more two we are one with christ that's why he said that um, in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, that he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So is our sphere and our element, is our realm and our element. The realm is where we live, like the realm of a fish is water. As our element is the very essence of our being, just like the essence of an orange fruit is the juice. So people are buying the fruits, the orange fruits, because of the juice. If the juice is poisoning us, nobody is going to come towards that orange. So our element as believers, as Christians, is Christ. The element is usually is really invisible from the external because you buy an orange, you don't see the fruit outside. You just have to cut it to see the fruit in there. So our element as Christians and people are, God is bringing people to us as Christians so that they can reap the essence of Christ from our life. Another example of an element is a golden cup. The element of a golden cup is gold. <laughs> you could have ceramic cup, you could have silver cup, but they don't carry the same value. So the Christ becoming our element is what a treasure. And we have a different teaching on that, on Christ as our sphere and our elements. Um, I think we have it on our YouTube page, the all inclusive Christ. 
so for this Romans 11, for if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy, and if the root is holy, so are the branches as well. Still giving us the picture of this grafting that we have in Christ. The first fruit may be the first part of a bread, and the, if that first part is, 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 um, is sanctified unto God, the whole loaf, the whole bread as well, the remaining part of it, the lump, is also holy. Holy means that it is set aside for God, separated, sanctified for God, sacred for God and what a joy and if the root is holy so are the branches as well so and if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive tree which was what we were in Adam in the fallen race were grafted in among them reading ahead and with them became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree so we became a partaker of the roots and the fatness of the Holy Tree through grafting. So here is our divine, here is our human nature. God has now brought us in union, grafted us into the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is divinity plus humanity, because he became flesh. The word became flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. God did this so that we can come together. Just like in grafting as well, you don't bring uh, two trees of different species or different types together. For example, uh, you, you can't bring a coconut tree and uh, a banana to say that you want to produce a unique fruit. They have to be in the same line. But in this context, that's why he had to become a man. He had to become a man. So that way, and he also made us in the likeness and image of him in creation. So that, because he knew, he knew Adam was going to sin. So he knew that one day he was going to graft us into the person of Christ. So Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me. So I have been crucified. In the death of Christ, we were crucified on the cross of Calvary. That's the truth. We were identified with him in the person. So because God said that we ate the fruit with Adam when Adam fell in the garden of Eden. So God is now justified to say that. I know you weren't there physically, but because these are two federal heads, these are two representative heads, the old creation, Adam, the new creation, Christ. And whatever the head has done, the whole body will suffer the punishment. So Adam, as the head of the old creation, disobeyed God. He fell to the temptation of the enemy. So every other person in the old creation was corrupt before God. We now have the the divine, the human nature, which is the sinful nature. Sin came into man. This is Romans chapter 5. And through sin, death came in. Now God is now justified to say that because Christ, who is now the head of the new creation, obeyed God to the fullest. He offered himself as a sacrifice. So God now says that since Adam, when Adam was eating that food, I said you were in Adam. So I'm justified now. For as many that have accepted my son, the head of the new creation, I'm justified to now say that they were also crucified with Christ. That's why we go through the water baptism to identify with him in his death. This Romans 6. So it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. What a joy, what a joy for what the Lord has done for us. So he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. So God is saying that anyone that eats his flesh and drinks his blood abides in him and he in us in John chapter 6. As the living Father sent me and I live by the Father, so he who feeds on me shall live by me. It's a guarantee the Lord is saying that why don't you get yourself preoccupied with just feeding on me? As humans, we are tempted. There are so many things that we want to do. We think we can do in our own ability, we can in our own capacity. We think we can say, by flesh shall no man prevail. But God is now saying that eat of me as you eat of me. The, the Lord's meal, the word of God, because Christ is the word of God. God is saying that the Lord will be living through our life. So our preoccupation, he said, he will eat my flesh and drink my blood, abides in me. And I want to abide in the Lord. And I'm sure same for you as well as a believer, because people should be coming to me or to you or the works of our life, not because of us, but because of Christ they are reaping from our life. That's my biggest prayer I ever want to pray, my God, that Lord, let me be a Christian. I'm sure it's the same for you, that let us be a Christian that adds value wherever we go, so that men will see our good work and glorify our Father who is in heaven, because we are the lights of the world, the salt of the earth, so we are the aroma of Christ, <laughs> we are the embodiment of Christ, he is the very content that they are coming to reap, he is the treasure in this earthen verses. So, and, but he's saying that we should keep eating him, we should keep eating him. He said, whoever eats him shall live by him. What a joy, what a joy that the Lord will continue to feed us with the bread of life, with the living bread as well. So, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. This is Ephesians chapter 5, that we are members, we are the bone of his bone. 
That's why we are in union with Christ. He's the one. <laughs> he has made us one with him in the person in his, uh, in his resurrected state. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church, which is all the believers, the corporate Christ. So, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. In that same 1 Corinthians 6, and also in that same 1 Corinthians, he also says that our body is for the Lord and the Lord is for our body. So you can imagine that the Lord has made himself one with us. He said we are members of his body of his flesh and of his bones that is when adam saw him he said this is the bone of my bone and i believe that the lord says that of us that we are the bone of his bone yes we are not perfect because somebody might say oh, but really well, well i can him being an exalted person come down yeah you could call us dogs gentile dogs but god the lion of judah has come could you imagine a lion and a dog coming together in a holy matrimony if it's possible adding that poor illustration but just imagine how secure that dog would be in the animal kingdom that dog is going to feel like a king because he's going to feel that because the people are going to be respecting that dog every other animal not because of the dog but because of the lion that is his spouse and the lord himself the lion of judah the prevailing lion lamb has now made us we formerly gentile dogs and has brought us into oneness with himself it's just it just makes us full of thanksgiving to god that's why all through the new testament he say in everything we give thanks to god true uh, for, for this is the will of god in christ jesus that is the will of god for us in every situation we are people that are full of thanksgiving because of what god has done for us what a great mystery of what the lord has done and is still doing for so for this union to be a reality the lord had to take certain steps it wasn't an easy thing it wasn't just a plug and play he had to become a man so the word became flesh god had to manifest in the flesh he had to become a man he had to come from immortality to become a mortal being and he had to also die as man's ransom he had to die in our stead because we were falling and we had to be he had to pay the price for our redemption he purchased us Acts 2028 says that the church of the living god which he purchased with his own blood so he purchased us by dying for us and so his blood was a currency which he used to buy he said we were, we are not of our own we were bought with a price from first corinthians so he had to resurrect as a life-giving spirit that would now live in us his believers so he now purchased us he resurrected as a spirit that gives life first corinthians 15 45 that now lives in us a saint. What a joy, what a joy. So today we've been able to look at our eternal union with Christ. We said that there are two mystical unions in the Bible and the top two mystical unions are probably the only two mystical unions I would say. The union of the divine trinity, that is the union of the Godhead. And we had a video lesson for that so on our YouTube page, God as a Father, the Son, and as the Spirit. We dealt more, more on the union of the Divine Trinity. It's just beyond its bottomless that revelation. It's just as much as the Lord opens our eyes to see. We looked at a lot of scriptures from that video. Also, the first union, the union of the Divine Trinity. Also, the second union, the union of Christ and the believers. We said these are mystical unions. They are organic union because the a coherence union because the parties are living in one another. And you had the finding any other illustration around our earthly realm where humans are living in each other but that's the goal of god's plan for christ's redemption we said that union with christ was what god thought about in eternity past when he, he created us in his image so that we'll be in union with christ because if you're going to uh, you can have to put a square peg in this and in this you can't put a square peg in a round hole so he made us in his image because he was going to bring us in union with christ who is the image of god he also predestined us in eternity past through our union with christ we said that our choosing was in union with christ uh, our fellowship with god is through union you know, with christ every blessing in the new testament in the old testament is through union with christ because israel the blessing they were getting was just because they were in covenant union with god and the that wasn't the perfect arrangement that was the letter the law now we have a living law the person of the lord jesus christ so we said everything we enjoy in the new testament is through our union with christ predestination justification reconciliation transformation regeneration confirmation renewal fellowship with god spending eternity with god in the eternity future everything is rooted in the person of the lord jesus christ we said that because we're in union with him we call him our lord we call him our husband our head our vine our foundation he calls us his temple his house his wife his bride and what a joy and we also said there are certain phrases that we see all through the new testament that shows to us our union with christ in christ in him by womb through christ in womb 
all through the Bible, it's all through there. God is trying to bring this to our knowledge that we are not just of the old creation. Now we are in the new creation because we are now in union with the head of the new creation, who is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We looked at all the scripture. We also said that our union with Christ. Also, God is saying that the more we eat him, he said that those who eat him, that as the living father sent him, John 6, 57, so whoever eats him shall live by him. His goal is that we are in union with him, that wherever we go, we are the manifestation manifestation of Christ in that environment. Yes, the Lord incarnated in flesh in the days of the four Gospels. Today, the Lord is still incarnating himself because we are the incarnation of Christ. I could say that in my own opinion because we are the manifestations of Christ in every place. That's why he calls us his body. A head without a body will have no function. We know we will be powerless, but he as the head now decides to walk through us his living body. In the four Gospels, we have him as the God-man who came to die for our sin, who came to pass through death so that he could reproduce himself as a grain of wheat. From the days or from the book of Acts, we now have him reproducing himself, duplicating himself in his disciples and his believers even till date because we are his expression everywhere we go. That's why I said in Colossians 3 that in all that you do, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a joy for what the Lord has done with us. Hallelujah to the all-inclusive Christ. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah.